Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Harrington, the theater editor at the New York Times. And I am so delighted to welcome you all to the Times Center. Um, across the Times newsroom, uh, we have spent the last two years bringing our journalism to readers around the world in virtual events. And those of us who cover theater have also spent those last two years reporting the story of an entire industry coming to a near total shutdown and now reopening and trying to find its way back forward again. We don't like cliches here at the Times, but it's true that Broadway's reopening season has been like none other. So we are thrilled to come together again today to enjoy songs and conversations with the amazing artists from some of this season's Tony-nominated musicals. And I am here, I am here, I am very happy to welcome not only our virtual audience, but also our in-person audience here in the Times Center. Um, and that audience includes New York City public school students and Times subscribers. So thank you all for joining us, um, and thank you to everyone joining us virtually from around the world. Um, I also just wanted to thank a couple of people, our colleagues on the events team, as well as our producers, Rachel Karp and uh, Beth Weinstein, for collaborating with us uh, to bring this event to life. I also wanted to give a little shout out to our deputy arts and leisure editor, Scott Heller. Um, so anyway, so <laughs> yes. <but. laughs> So now um, let's enjoy some great songs, shall we? I'm going to welcome to the stage um, our theater reporter, um, Michael Paulson. Hi. Hi, everybody. So yeah, I'm Michael Paulson. I cover theater here. Uh, and just to answer the question that everyone asks, yes, they pay me to go to theater. Um, but I, uh, and I write stories. I'm not a critic. I write stories, uh, news and features about the industry and the art form. And I'm so glad that uh, to be here today, I'm so glad that we have these incredible artists waiting just outside that door who are going to tell you a little about what they do and also show you. And I'm really glad that you're all here, because obviously it's been a while since we've been able to be together. And it's so great to see so many people who love theater. So I am going to take my seat, and we are going to start um, today's event. You're going to hear from all six shows that are nominated for Best Musical in the Tony Awards. And you're also going to hear from one of the shows nominated for Best Musical Revival. Um, so, our first show is MJ. Uh, MJ, yep. Uh, MJ is a biomusical about Michael Jackson. Uh, the production is set in 1992 in Los Angeles, where Michael Jackson is in the final stages of rehearsing for the Dangerous World Tour. Uh, joining us now is that show's star, Tony nominee Miles Frost. He's going to perform Stranger in Moscow, a special arrangement of that song by the show's music director, Jason Michael Webb. So give him a big round of applause. How y'all feeling? I said, how y'all feeling? Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. We in here. Thank you all so, so very much for, for coming out. And we really appreciate it. And uh, without further ado. Wandering in the rain, mask of life, feeling insane. Swift and sudden, far from grace. Sunny days seem far away. Crimson shadow belittling me. Stalin's tomb won't let me be. On and on and on it came. 
just the way would just let me be how does it feel how does it feel when you're alone in your cold inside here abandoning my fame I'm a getting up the brain KGB was talking me taking my name and just let me be then a bigger boy called my name sunny days will drown the pain on and on and on it came and came and again and again how does it feel now how does it feel how does it feel how does it feel I just want to take I just want to take a moment to to just express how amazing this orchestra is. <laughs> and um, I want to read out their I want to read out their names. Uh, first of all, the conductor um, and music director Jason Michael Webb, who's amazing, plays your show with me every night. Um, we got Belinda Whitney on violin, Tally Bernfeld on violin, Paul uh, Waddell on violin. Uh, Melissa Tong on violin, Richard Bryce on viola, Jocelyn Pan on viola, Carolyn Peisner on cello, Niles Luther on cello, and my girl Alex Nolan on guitar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are quite the shoes, by the way. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're 22 years old. Yes. This is your first Broadway show. Yeah. You dropped out of college to, or took a break <laughs> from college to do this. Mm -hmm. And now you're playing Michael Jackson. What, what like goes through your head when you try to slip into that character? <laughs> um, I'm very humble. You know, it's humbling to be able to do this and, and represent such an icon and get the response that I, I get from it. You know, I, it means a lot to me. So getting into that mode is, it, I'm coming from a very uh, grateful standpoint. Yeah. an appreciative standpoint. And it just gives me the energy to, to keep going, especially with now the reception that I'm getting from. I'm like, okay, I know I'm doing something right. Yeah. Um, so this is obviously, you've come to Broadway during an especially bumpy season. This show's only been running since December and you yourself have had COVID twice. Yes, um, twice. The, the show had to shut down over Christmas because so many members of the company were testing positive like a lot of others. Mm -hmm. What are some of the complications of working in this environment? Uh, the bounce back, you know, having COVID twice is no joke, especially on your voice, you know, and tried to come back, do two shows. My first day coming back from the second time I had COVID, I tried to do two shows the day I came back. Got through the first one, but then my body said no midway through the second one. 
you know, and it, and it happens. So it messes with you mentally because you're like, oh my God, did something happen? Can I still do this, you know? And you just, you just gotta give your body some grace, you know, because my mind is, I can do it. I'm fine, I'll be all right, you know, but you gotta make sure that you don't push yourself too hard, you know, because your body will remind you that it's a body and that you are, <laughs> you know, and, and that you're human and you gotta take your time. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. So the song we just heard you sing, Stranger in Moscow, uh, was released at a pretty hard time in Michael Jackson's life. Yes. He had been accused of abuse. He was feeling wronged by the news media. It's often described as a song about loneliness and isolation. Mm -hmm. how, how do you connect with the emotions in the song? Ooh, uh, they come from a real place. You know, first of all, like any, what I do on stage is, is not acting, it's, it's being. You know, I'm very, I'm very clear and I'm very present during all those, all of those scenes. So with this song in particular, you know, I've, <laughs> with the mother I have, my mom was like, you all, you're gonna be somebody, so you can't do what everybody else can do. You know, and it kind of made me think, okay, well, like, why, why can't I be with, you know, hang with these friends and, you know, do this, you know, I wanted to do that, I wanted to do this, you know. I couldn't play football, you know, I wanted to box. My mom was like, nah, you're gonna mess your face up, I don't want you to mess nothing up, because you, <laughs> Because you go be playing Michael Jackson on Broadway, right? You know, but um, you know, reaching from those places where I, I did feel like I couldn't, you know, really connect with people in the way that I wanted to, and felt kind of isolated. You know, and I'm, that's why I'm just blessed to have an abundance of people who care about me, a cast that cares about me, and um, who I care for. Um, you mentioned your mom. Um, I know you were raised by your mom and grandma. Yes. Can you talk a little about their role in your life? Oh, uh, raised by two very, very strong black women. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think the biggest thing that they've taught me was one, how to stand up for myself, and two, how to treat people. You know, you treat people how you want to be treated, and that's so simple, but somehow it gets overlooked all the time. You know, people, for, people forget that the energy that you put out is the energy that you get back. That's why I go through this whole process with no problem saying, like, I don't feel like I deserve, you know, this. You know, even, even being aware of the talent that I have because, you know, I didn't, this wasn't my dream. You know, I wanted to be a music artist. I wanted to be, you know, I still do. You know, but, so what now, but the fact that I'm here, I'm so grateful and appreciative and I understand and I'm humble. You know, I'm happy, <laughs> but, but I'm humble most of all. Um, you and I have talked a few times about your sense that when people come into this show, they have a variety of strong opinions about Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want people to take away from your performance about Michael Jackson? Understanding that we're all human. You know, um, I, what, what Lynn has done is, is very beautiful because I think it humanizes Michael. You know, it shows that he faces real people problems, finance, you know, financially, you know, emotionally, family, we all got people, in our, we all got crazy families, no matter how you try to present it on, you know, Instagram or whatever, like, we all got somebody in our family that we know, you know, and it just shows that Michael is the same way. And I want people to feel warm, you know, I want people to, people to feel that nostalgia, you know, for people who, are, who have been blessed to, see, blessed to see Michael when he was alive. You know, I didn't get that, that opportunity. I want to inspire children who Michael, you know, when, when, since they've been born, Michael's never been alive. You know, and to see them dressed out in Billie Jean outfits and beat jackets and Thriller jackets, you know. I had a prime example. I had a father, it was just two shows ago, I had a father, um, pulled me aside after the show and he said, my daughter said something very interesting. My, his daughter was six. During intermission, she said, Dad, I thought Michael Jackson was dead. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I say that to, not to brag on myself, but I say that to say that, you know, kids are really, are, are being inspired by this and, you know, I, this is what I do this for. Great. Well, congratulations on the performance, and thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thank you.
All right. Um, you having a good time? Yeah. All right, next up is Girl from the North Country, which is a fictional story about a group of down-on-their-luck Midwesterners whose lives intersect in 1934 in the midst of the Great Depression at a boarding house in Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth is not a random setting for this show. It's the birthplace of the great American singer-songwriter Bob Dylan, and the show's score is made up entirely of his songs, including the one we're about to hear, which is called Hurricane. Please join me in welcoming Austin Scott, joined by cast members Matthew Frederick Harris, Huso Simon, John Schiappa, Rachel Stern, Bob Walton, Chelsea Lee Williams, and Kiara Trentalong. Shots ring out in the barroom night Enter Patty Valentine from the upper hall She sees the bartender in a pool of blood Cries out, my God, they've killed them all Here comes the story of a hurricane The man in authorities came to blame For something that he never done Put in a prison cell, but one time he could have been the champion of the world. Three bodies lying made as Patty C. And another man named Bello moving around mysteriously. I didn't do what he says, and he throws up his hands. I was only robbing the register. I hope you understand. And so Patty calls the cops And they arrive on the scene uh, With their red lights flashing uh, in the hot New Jersey uh, night uh, All along the watchtower Princes kept the view All the women came and went Barefoot servants too Outside in the distance A wildcat did go out Two riders approaching now The wind began to howl When a cop pulled him over to the side of the road Just like the time before, the time before that In Patterson, that's just the way things go if you're black, you might as well not show up on the street Yes, you want to draw the Thank you so much. Please keep it going for our fantastic accompanists. We have Marco Pagia on piano, Martha McDonald on violin. Thank you all so much. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Great. Um, so Girl from the North Country opened just a week before theater shut down in March of 2020. That's true. Uh, restarted last fall, shut down again in January because of Omicron, restarted a third time in April. <laughs> That's got to um, be a record, right? It's got to be a record. <laughs> How do you like stay in it emotionally, physically, and vocally through all those ups and downs? I mean, one, it's just such an incredible group of artists. I mean, on stage and off stage, we are just a family, and we show up for each other every single time. And also, every time, every time something happens and we leave and we get to come back to it, we get to bring everything 
that we learned, you know, on the, in the time off and everything that we experienced back to the show. So it just keeps getting richer and deeper and deeper. So in a way, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. So the song that you just sang, Hurricane, was written as a protest song mm -hmm. by Bob Dylan about a real boxer, Reuben Hurricane Carter, who was wrongly convicted of murder. Uh, in the show, you play a one-time boxer who has just escaped from prison. Mm. Tell me about how this well, song... Well, did he? We don't well, know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> So tell me about how this song works for your character and for you. Yeah, so when I get to sing the song in the show, it's, it's in the middle of the second act, so actually you've got to see a lot of my arc already unfold. And when you first see me, I really have no idea what I'm doing next. You know, I, I'm just kind of, I'm dirty, I'm, I, I'm without a home, I'm just kind of rolling into this boarding house. And by the time you see me in this show, I've, I've found myself a little bit more. I've started to get my feet underneath me. And... I think this thing that I've been carrying with me the whole time just kind of bursts out and I tell this story. And it's, uh, it's been a privilege to get to tell this story, his story, and Reuben Carter's story, you know, in a way through, through this character because it's so, um, so resonant with what we're going on, going through right now, and especially in 2020 with George Floyd and everything like that. I, I brought all of that anger and all of that to, to the song and... and um, you know, it's just a privilege to get to tell that story. Yeah. So was Bob Dylan, like, on your iPod, or did you encounter his <laughs> music for the first My time? My iPod shuffle back in the day. Yeah, like, um, I mean, were you a Dylan fan, or did you just, like, audition for this? What's your relationship to his music, and what have you learned about it by doing this show? You know, I'm, I'm afraid most of Dylan's music I didn't realize was Dylan's music. Like, uh -huh. I knew, you know, Make You Feel My Love. I was like, that's a dope Adele song. I love that song. <laughs> You know, so good. And so I've just kind of slowly started to, you know, come to realize how much of, of his music I know, but I didn't know it was his. You know, he's so, yeah. so prolific and so, such an excellent writer. So in a lot of musicals, songs give the audience information about the plot or characters. They work a little bit differently in this show. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the role of music in this show? Yeah, it, it, it kind of depends on the character, but I think... Um, Jeanette Bayardell, who's in our cast, I should say, Tony nominee Jeanette Bayardell. Yeah, give it up for her. Phenomenal. I think she described it as, you know, kind of this beautiful painting or tapestry of, of, you know, humanity. And it's like you're getting to watch all of these people's lives unfold while you got like a dope Bob Dylan record playing in the background. You know what I mean? And it's kind of, that's how it is. It's, it's the, the songs don't necessarily move the, the story forward or the narrative forward, but they kind of serve as a, a soundtrack, almost like an emotional soundtrack to the moments that are happening on stage in, in their lives. And it's really beautiful, except with my character, it's a little more literal most of the time, you know? So I, I would, you know, in rehearsal, our director, um, Connor McPherson, Tony nominee Connor McPherson, I gotta do it every time. <laughs> Um, you know, he would say, you know, yeah, y'all just kind of, you know, s sing it as sing it as yourself. You know, it's it's Jeanette singing the song, or it's you know, it's um, Mary singing the song. Except you, Austin, you got to sing as the character. <laughs> it's like you got to do a little more work. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. So you spent several years starring in Hamilton, both on the road and on Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is a huge juggernaut. Now you're in a much smaller, intimate show. Some nights there are huge crowds, sometimes not. How does that like affect your performance and and you? Yeah, I mean, doing Hamilton, it was like a rock concert, right? I mean, you know, the, the energy was just so intense every single night, and that was really fun. And coming to do this, it's much more intimate. It's much more, you know, pared down. And I think at first I was a little thrown off because I was like, oh, they're not, you know, they're not bursting into applause. They're not laughing, you know, super hard stuff. They must, must not be into it. But I started to realize, no, it, they're, they're so into it that they're silent. You know, there's almost like a, a reverence in it, just like, you know, being, being glued to it. And not that that didn't happen in Hamilton, but it's, it's uh, I feel really privileged to get to kind of experience those two things back to back, you know, yeah. and just see the breadth of storytelling and audience response and, you know, just doing this thing that I love. Yeah. Um, speaking of doing the thing that you love, we have a number of high school and college students in the audience tonight. What's up, y'all? Uh, <laughs> uh, what kind of advice do you have for people who might be thinking about wishing they could find a home in this world? Yeah. Um, I think some advice I would give my high school self um, would be kind of just, you know, keep your eyes on your own paper. 
and know that, you know, everyone, there's a season, there's a time, everyone has different timelines and, you know, try not to focus so much on what that person's doing and how fast it's happening for them and all that and just kind of trust in the process and just just do the thing because you love it, you know, and just trust that, that it'll come in time when the time is right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the new musical Six, um, apparently some of you have heard of it, uh, already a, a hit in London before it arrived on Broadway. It offers a revisionist take on British history, imagining a singing competition in which the ill-fated wives of Henry VIII regale one another and us with catchy tunes about their terrible marriages. Um, <laughs> So wife number three was Jane Seymour, who died after giving birth to the male heir Henry had wanted. Uh, and today we're going to hear a new arrangement of her ballad called Heart of Stone, uh, performed by Kirsten Nicole Hodgins, Courtney Mack, and Mallory Medke. <laughs> Restless tide, untamable. You came my way in a new storm could come to you to lift me high or let me fall. Soon I'll have 
to go I'll never see him grow but I hope my I son hope my will son know. will know he'll, he'll never never Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the themes of this theater season has been the, what we've come to think of as heroism of understudies and covers and standbys and everybody else who has had to go on to keep a show going when someone or a bunch of someones has tested positive for COVID. Uh, you're all alternates in the Broadway cast of six. And <laughs> And uh, as I understand it, each of you covers three roles. Yes. yes. Um, how do you keep all the different dance moves and the personalities <laughs> straight in your head? It's a good mm -hmm. question. That's a very good question. <laughs> I just think we keep like telling ourselves like today I'm Aragon or today I'm Seymour. We just have to like keep reminding yeah. ourselves day by day. Yeah. I just before I go in, I say, okay, what <laughs> happened to me today? Oh, I died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was the survivor <laughs> tomorrow. I'm going to be the survivor tomorrow. You know, I just say I died, I survived, or, you know, beheaded, whatever it is. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. uh, Kirsten, you're uh, based here in New York, but you had to go to Chicago on a moment's notice when the tour was about to open there. One of the, um, one of the principals got sick. Tell us about that experience. Yes, it's Kirsten. Kirsten, sorry. Um, and no, no worries. But I got a call. Um, I believe it was on a Saturday. I literally woke up, wiped the crust out of my eyes, and <laughs> um, and you know, hello. Um, how do you feel about flying to Chicago? To possibly, well, it was like, do you could you fly tonight? Maybe tomorrow? Maybe Monday? We don't know. And I was like, I just you. I, it was a lot to comprehend, you know what I mean? And I was like, I mean, yes, at this point, like you said, we do so much. Um, and like on a, on a whim when people, you know, like get COVID and stuff. So I've gotten to the point where I just like kind of just say yes and just go wherever it takes me. But yeah, I ended up leaving that Monday and then was in the show the next day. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. So never knowing who you're going to play has to lead to some unexpected hiccups. Can you share any moments when <laughs> things didn't go as planned? Like, <laughs> and talk about how you recovered. They got some fun ones. Like, <laughs> so many. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. We do like, I mean, if we're, if we're going like back and forth, back and forth all the time, um, like I've had days where I'm, I'm Howard one day and then I'm Boleyn the next and then I'm back to Howard. So then I keep like flip-flopping. 
and the dance moves are are like um, mirrored. Or mirrored. Mm -hmm. So like you know, there's times where you sneak in some weird yeah. <laughs> arm movements and whatnot, and then you think about it the, for the rest of the show. Um, <laughs> it's just like, right. it's at you. Um, but I've actually had to go on mid-show before, which is like really hard to do in this show um, because there is no intermission, mm. and that's like the most psychotic thing mm -hmm. to go through. <laughs> sort of like. You like you don't even expect it. Um, so you're sitting backstage. Somebody's not feeling well. They yeah. tap you on the shoulder. Get into costume. Run on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and now, and we're I like running like to get to makeup say, brushes. We're like, what lines do you need us to do right now while she's so, getting ready? Um, you know, and we do. We listen. We do. We do our jobs and we do run the show. But this particular day. <laughs> Courtney was knitting. <laughs> like she, Courtney had her legs up with her blanket up and was just knitting. And then they come in and just chaos. You know, she was just, poor lady was just trying to relax. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I forgot she was knitting. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> six has become this huge phenomenon, uh, thanks in large part to this youthful fan base that you guys call the Queendom. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about why you think this show has caught on so much, especially with young women uh, in particular, and how that affects the experience of working in the show? I mean, to see a full cast of women and also a full band, every, every a person in our show is female identifying. And when do we ever get to see that? It's like the first experience. And also to have a cast of BIPOC actors, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I think everyone can see themselves on stage, which is the most important thing. And um, I feel like all of us as humans also felt um, a change in ourselves. Like I feel like we all have more empowered voices be, because of doing this show. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's just so much fun. It, it's just a blast. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. So I'm going to ask you the question that I asked Austin. Uh, what kind of wisdom do you have for students in the audience who might be interested in some kind of career in the arts? Mm. Perform for yourself and for no one else. That is something that I've had to learn just growing up in this industry. Um, and I think when you do that, you just have so much more fun. Mm -hmm and um, rejection will be easier because of that, because at the end of the day, you're doing this for you and um, to make you happy. And yeah, I just think that that's really important. Yeah. Yes, um, right, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think my biggest piece of advice would be to um, trust your gut and to trust your instinct. Um, there's a lot of push and pull in this industry, you know, especially students, you know, when you have showcases and things like that, you'll have professors, you know. Well, for me, you know, it was like, oh, we think you should go to New York, or we think you should go here, we think you should go there. Like, really trust, and even when it comes to like what you want to do, what career path, whether you want to do, you know, acting, uh, musical theater, whatever it may be, just to trust your gut and, and believe in yourself, because you have a lot more power than maybe you may think sometimes. So just yeah. stand up for yourself. You want the last word? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, I would say never give up if it's something that you're really wanting, if you want to pursue this. You know, there's been so many times where in like college and throughout my career thus far where I've, you know, called my parents just sobbing, being like, why did I do this? Um, but, you know, I never gave up and I persisted and, you know, um, you really do have to have thick skin to be in this business. So it's just the mindset of keep going, keep climbing the ladder, and it might be a uh, zigzag ladder. It's not going to take you all the way up, but, you know, just keep going. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Courtney, Mallory, Kirsten, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, you guys. <laughs> all right. Our next show is a new musical called The Strange Loop. Um, the uh, Pulitzer writing author of A Strange Loop is with us in the audience, so welcome. Um, Michael R. Jackson. 
Uh, Strange Loop is a little bit harder to describe than some of the other shows, but here goes. Uh, it's a musical about a gay black musical theater writer trying to write a musical about a gay black musical theater writer trying to write a musical about a gay black musical. You get the idea. <laughs> and he's doing this while haunted by a kind of discouraging inner dialogue brought to life by six actors playing his thoughts. Uh, we are joined tonight by the show's Tony-nominated star, uh, Jacqueline Spivey. <laughs> Along with, uh, <laughs> he's joined by Tony nominees John Andrew Morrison, L. Morgan Lee, <laughs> as well as Antoine Hopper, James Jackson Jr., John Michael Lyles, and Jason Beasy. frustrated by what he experiences as the societal expectations of black men, tries to channel the power of the white female rocker he imagines within himself. <laughs> Here's Inner White Girl. Introduce our musicians as well. Uh, this is Marcus Walls on percussion and Mike Petty on guitar. On days his blackness feels like another hurdle that won't get out of his way. His inner white girl starts kicking like a baby. She wants to come out and play. She doesn't care if she ruffles any feathers. In fact, that is her MO. Where he's the king of avoiding confrontation, there's not a bomb she won't throw. Because white girls can do anything, can't they? Black boys must always obey their mothers. White girls can do anything, can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Someday she feels like his blackness is a treasure that's under constant attack. Hey, 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 hey. His inner white girl protects you. it from marauders. You. She always takes up the slack. Hey, 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 hey. She lets him feel like a human supernova, like he could conquer the earth, like he's the heir to the power and oppression. Her kind of food. Because white girls can do anything, can't they? Black boys must always obey their mothers. White girls can do anything, can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Can't they? They get to be cool, tall, vulnerable, and luscious. They get to be wild and unwise. They get to be shy and introspective. They get to make noise. His blackness doesn't look blue in any moonlight, which makes him harder to see. That's why he clings to his silly inner white girl, the same one clinging to me. We want to be free. We want to belong. Make noise, we want to mesmerize. 
Why can't we unleash what's locked inside us? Who made up these rules that black boys had to obey? Hey, y'all. <laughs> so what is your inner white girl saying? Um, my inner white girl is saying, take a damn nap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my inner white girl is saying, I'm tired, um, and I need some rest. But you know, Jacquel is saying, you got a show to do tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you are. Well, thank you. So I took a stab at explaining the show's structure a musical theater writer haunted by his thoughts. But what would you say the show is really about? I think the show is about reality. I think the show is about real life, which is not very Broadway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it touches on topics that we don't often see eight shows a week. Um, and it's also the point of view of someone who is in the theater, but is often hidden because they're not the look of what theater's supposed to be or the sound of what theater's supposed to sound like. So this is your first professional acting job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you graduated from college a year ago. Tell me what surprises you. What have you learned uh, from doing this? Um, I learned that though I went to school for musical theater, um, I missed out on a lot of stuff. <laughs> And I'm learning it here. There are just some things that, for those of you who are in college or are going to go to college for theater, there's some stuff that they just can't teach you uh, because it might ruin your experience of what you're going into. It's just being honest. It's hard. Um, you do turn into a product at some point. You have to accept that and learn how to keep the artistry first. But there's a lot of noise that they don't tell you about. And you have to work your way through that noise to just give a great performance every night. Yeah. So your character experiences so much rejection and pain mm. from family, from the gay community, from the professional world. How do you avoid taking all that brokenness home with you? Well, see, before I had the show, I had that experience. <laughs> so uh, it came home with me from high school. <laughs> it came home with me from church with my mama. Uh, but I think I learned how to cope and I learned how to live a healthy life through all those circumstances. Um, and I also think I just learned my worth as a person and as an artist. Um, but I'm also very careful of not letting Jacquel's experience slip into Usher's. Because right. it's like, he's fat, I'm fat, he black, I'm black, he queer, I'm queer. We both artists, right? So it's easy to be like, oh my god, this is my story. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm telling them my story every night. And it's like, no, that's not your story. It's similar, so, but it's not yours. <laughs> yeah, so I just had to, I had to learn how to separate this character that I play every night versus who I have to go home and be. Yeah. Yeah. So the conceit of the show is that uh, the lead character's inner thoughts are present and mm -hmm. speak. Um, if there were thoughts in your head that turned into characters, what would they be? Ooh. <laughs> Time management. <laughs> Sleep paralysis. <laughs> um, those two for right now. <laughs> Money management. <laughs> they hear me. Um, yeah, I, but I also think um, there are those thoughts in me that are encouraging. There are those thoughts that are like, you can do it. Um, especially right now, I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm really struggling. For the first time, I dealt with allergies. Shout out to New York City. <laughs> and um, those allergies turned into a sinus infection. Oh. 
So I was out of the show for over a week because I couldn't sing and I still have it. So it's like trying to navigate, you too, huh? Yeah, so I'm still, I'm still trying to navigate doing all these shows with a sinus infection because the work never stops. Um, but I think the biggest lesson was if I am not ready and able, it's probably not wise to force myself because the show's gonna be there. And also that's why we have understudies. Everybody wants to hog the role. But understudies are there to save the show. Yeah. Um, so I just learned, like, if I'm sick, go home yeah. and rest so that you can give the best show you can. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the strangest or funniest thing that you've heard in reaction to this show from, like, a fan or an audience member? I, it was strange, I think, because I was new to the show when it happened. But when we were in D.C., and it was after one of our first performances, and there was this elderly Caucasian lady. And she came up to me after in tears, and she said, you told my story tonight. <laughs> Y'all heard what we just sang, right? OK, so I was like, oh, God bless you. Thank you for coming. And then, you know, then there would be like someone else who is not anything like Usher. And they're like, you told my story. You told my story. Um, but I think because of the truth that's in this piece, it's so easy to go to theater and see something that has nothing to do with reality, right? It's like you go see a show and it's like, this was cute, but you leave unaffected. It's like you were entertained for two hours, but nothing in your life has changed. So to go to a show and to be like, that happened to me. I've been through that. Like, that's what this show does, and that's what I'm able to do, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the show, and thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I don't know. I, I think you got it. I actually got out. <laughs> All right, so I'm delighted that we have one musical revival in the mix today. Uh, it's a show called Company. Um, so Company, when it first opened on Broadway in 1970, was about an unmarried man turning 35. Uh, now, uh, with a rethought configuration, it's about an unmarried woman turning 35. In both versions, Bobby, the main character, is surrounded by paired-off friends whose relationships are alternately inspiring and terrifying. <laughs> the show uh, features a brilliant score by the great Stephen Sondheim, who, uh, who made it to the first post-shutdown preview of this production, but then died before opening night. Uh, one of the show's songs, called Getting Married Today, is... Um, <laughs> is uh, particularly noted for how hard it is to sing, but also for the cleverness of its language. It's about a severe case of wedding day jitters. And here to sing an abbreviated version orchestrated just for us is Tony nominee Matt Doyle. everybody there because if everybody's there want to thank you all for coming to the wedding I'd appreciate your going even more I mean you must have lots of better things to do not a word of it to Paul remember Paul you know the man I'm gonna marry but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is but I thank you all for the gifts and the flowers thank you all now it's back to the showers don't tell Paul but I'm not getting married today Listen, everybody, look, I don't know what you're waiting for. A wedding, what's a wedding? It's a prehistoric ritual where everybody promises fidelity forever, which is maybe the most horrifying word I've ever heard, and which is followed by a honeymoon where suddenly you realize it's Santa with the nut, want to kill me like a should, so this is thanks a bunch, but I'm not getting married. Go have lunch, because I'm not getting married. You've been grand, but I'm not getting married. Don't just stand there, I'm not getting married. And don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. 
go? Can't you go? Why is nobody listening? Goodbye, go and cry at some other person's wake. If you're quick for a kick, you could pick up a christening. But please, on my knees, there's a human life at stake. Listen, everybody, I'm afraid you didn't hear. Do you want to see a crazy person fall apart in front of you? It isn't only Paula may be ruining his life. You know, we'll both of us be losing our identities. I telephone my shrinkity, so maybe I should come and see him Monday. But by Monday, I'll be floating in the Hudson with the other garbage. I'm not well, so I'm not getting married. You've been swell, but I'm not getting married. Clear the hall, because I'm not getting married. Thank you all, but I'm not getting married. And don't tell Paula, but I'm not getting married today. Go, can't you go? Look, you know I adore you all, but why watch me die when I'm only being nice? Look, perhaps I'll collapse in the apps right before you also take back the cake, burn the shoes, and boil the rice. Look, I didn't want to have to tell you, but I may be coming down with hepatitis. I'm feeling kind of faint. If you want to see me faint, I'll do it happily. But wouldn't it be funnier to go and watch a funeral? So thank you for the 27 dinner plates and 37 salables and 47 picture frames, 57 get older. One more thing. I am not getting married. With this ring. But I'm not getting married. Simply said. Still, I'm not getting married. Either way. See, I'm not getting married. Let us pray that we're not getting married today. Wow, you want to take a breath? Uh, yeah, it's always so, so strange doing that song out of context. That's the scariest that it is because it's just me and the mic and those words and I'm like, just hang on, just hang on. <laughs> so, that song is so remarkable. It requires you to sing so many words in rapid succession and yeah. still you have to somehow be both clear and funny. Yeah. Uh, was it, <laughs> what is it like taking that on and what did it take to, to get comfortable with the number? It was like training for a sporting event, really. I mean, we started from the ground up. First, you have to get the muscle memory of the song down and really make sure that the words are with you. I mean, with you and ingrained in you. And then from there, we started to layer on the thought. And that's where Marianne Elliott really came into play. The director. She, yes, our director, our brilliant director. Yes. Um, who layered in all of the color, and she, she wouldn't let me have a single run-on thought. Everything had to be triggered by the thought before, and she had to see it. And that was a new, a new part of the training that I really had to take on. And so, for instance, part of me is everybody there, because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. Those are three different thoughts, and that's how complicated it got with her. And uh, I was a little impatient at first, because I just wanted to get through the piece, and we would stop every two seconds and make sure the thought was there. And, uh, and then Stephen came into the room and, and added his, his uh, wisdom, which was speed. <laughs> <laughs> Steve was big on the speed and making sure that the speed was there and said it's easier if the speed is there, and then we layered in the uh, pretty wild physical comedy that is in the actual production as yeah. well. So do you ever trip, get tongue-tied? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And at first I was so, so frustrated when it would happen because it happens if there's like just a little bit of spit or if I have to burp. <laughs> <laughs> So I always just tell myself, you know, spit happens, and that's okay, and take a breath. I've never gotten completely off, though. Um, I usually just trip a little bit within the rhythm, and uh, I'm sure now that I've said that to you, there will be a huge crash and burn tonight. <laughs> um, so you've done quite a bit of musical theater. Yeah. For you as a performer, what is distinctive about the work of Stephen Sondheim? He writes for the actor. I mean, really, truly. Every single note and... and uh, and word that he writes is there for a reason, has intention, and that makes him very Shakespearean. And, and I think that it's so easy to dive into his work because it's all there on the page. And I know that as uh, an actor who trained in classical theater and, and believes in text-based text work, and I know Marianne Elliott feels the same way, that's thrilling. I mean, that it's all offered to you within the, the song and on the page. It's so exciting to be able to take that on and go through his madness and into his brain and, uh, and his genius. 
So Sondheim was a big supporter of this production. Can you talk a little about his relationship to it and how his death affected both the cast and the run? Yeah, we were so thrilled to be working with him so closely throughout the production. He was there uh, with us in the 2020 rehearsals and then we didn't see a lot of him when we came back from the pandemic. We were supposed to open on his 90th birthday back in 2020. And um, he came back and sat in the audience with us on our first preview and it was the first time a lot of us had seen him in over two years and or close to two years and it was so emotional and I know a lot of us had a hard time delivering our songs that night because it was very just frightening to stand in front of him and want to make sure that it was a perfect moment for him and uh, I I'll never forget watching him stand at the end of getting married and um, he came up to me at the end of the show as well and he really loved George Firth's work and believed in these scenes so much and the scene that follows getting married today is just a gorgeous really um, emotionally complex scene that happens and there's one line at the end that is I'm the next bride and he always said to me I want you to scream that up to the rafters and I was never doing it the way he wanted in the first set of previews back in 2020 so that night I made sure that I like yelled it with every bit of my soul and uh, I yelled it up to the rafters and he came up to me with tears in his eyes and put a hand on my shoulder and just said that's it and it can never be less than that and um, <laughs> and I, I remember that every night I think it's getting a little too absurd now actually but <laughs> But uh, he, he believed in this production because of what it was doing for new audiences and that it was bringing new people into his work. And he believed in evolving his work and wanted to create until the day he died. And we really felt his loss when he passed because we, we lost the, the ringleader, the, the, the master that was in charge really, other than Marion Elliott, who was saying, I, I want to push it forward. Yeah. Um. One of the things that excited him about this production, one of the innovations, is that it changes the gender and the sexuality of mm -hmm. several of the characters, including yours. Yeah. Um, you're uh, playing someone thinking about entering a same-sex marriage. Yeah. It was a potential heterosexual marriage in the original. How do you think that changes the song and the scene? You know, it's interesting. The first time I was working on the piece, something that I had to recognize that I didn't expect is that I couldn't just do what all of my female icons that have done this song before have done. And there's a lot of um, unsaid sexism that goes with that too. You can't, as a man, deliver a panic attack the same way as a woman does. People react differently to a man having an emotional breakdown than a woman. And that really caught me off guard and was something that I had to explore throughout our preview process the first time and in the rehearsal room of how to keep Jamie endearing and likable and I, I grew up watching Madeline Kahn and I grew up watching you know Vianne Cox and all these brilliant women do this song and I had to really just recognize that as soon as I could take it on for myself as the perspective of a gay man with an anxiety disorder oops, excuse me with with an anxiety disorder and really just bring myself into it um, that's when the piece really started to work and I think that there's so many added anxieties uh, for gay men right now in terms of considering gay marriage and how they fit into this heteronormative institution and what it means for them. They fought so hard for it, but do you just jump into it with this partner that you've been with and everything works? And, and I think that's what Jamie's feeling is, why, why do we have to try and make this work for us? And that's a whole new layer to the scene that wasn't there before. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next show is a musical adapted from a movie, Billy Crystal's Mr. Saturday Night. About, um, uh, it's about a washed up comedian wishing to make a comeback. Um, uh, we were going to have Shoshana Bean and Billy Crystal, but COVID has interfered. Uh, we have Jason Robert Brown, who has won three Tony Awards and is nominated again this year uh, for the score. He's going to perform at Farber's for Mr. Saturday Night.
There's nothing more exciting than following an entire stage full of extraordinarily talented singers and actors who've been doing their parts for months, maybe years. And I have been doing this song for the past six seconds. I'm already going too fast. I'm going to slow it down because I don't know the words. Anyway, the thing I want to tell you is at Farber's takes place the show takes place, some of it takes place in the 50s, some of it takes place in the 90s. None of it takes place now, unless you go see it, in which case then it is. Anyway, the point is, it's sort of a strange loop conversation I'm having. This part takes place in the 50s. I'm a little nervous for Christ's sakes. So um, this takes place in the 50s at a resort in the Catskills. If you're Jewish, you know what it means to be at a resort in the Catskills in the 50s. If you're not Jewish, it's like outer space. Um, but uh, this is the, uh, the head of Farber's, the great Catskills Resort Farber's, who comes out to welcome you to his fabulous hotel. Come escape the heat of the city, come where it's pretty, jump in the car here. Why go south? We've got Shangri-La here. Come on up to Farber's. From the Bronx to Brooklyn, they run here looking for fun. Here's your invitation. When you're done, you'll need a vacation. Come on up to Farber's. The Borscht Belt, lovely partial mountain views. The Borscht Belt, like the Bible Belt, but for the Jews. Well, thank you, I gotta laugh. All the biggest stars, find them right here. Saturday night, there's always the best here. Some are born and some laid to rest here. Come on up to Farber's. Biking and swimming, hiking, so slimming, liking. Your waiters, most are in dental school, nice boys. Single ladies, you'll find your catch here, your perfect match here, eager and willing. Makes a living, if not a killing. Snatch him up at Farber's! Now, as your social director, I'm going to explain what's coming up this week at Farber's. I'm gonna go minor. Monday night's the luau, where we light the tiki torch. Tuesday, Simon says, led by our tumbler on the porch. Wednesday is the champagne dance, once your dinner's settled. Thursday's the Mikado, but we set it in the shtetl. The Borscht Belt, where the hoi polloi retreats. The Jewish Alps, the land of cabbage, sour cream and beets, Alka Seltzer. Pile high the plates on the table, whitefish and sable, roast beef and salmon. Somewhere in the world there's a famine. Come on up, have a blast, meet your mate, break your fast at Faber. How you doing? You came for Shoshana Bean. You got a nice, white, middle-aged Jewish guy. Um, yeah, speaking of, I should clarify, Shoshana's uh, out sick, and Billy is just being super cautious, uh, given... Everybody's everything. being super cautious. You walk yes, over to our acceptance. theater, everyone's like encased in rubber. It's yeah, yeah, terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so this musical was adapted from a 1992 film. Yes. Uh, how did you go about figuring out what the musical style should be when you started working on this project? It was really easy for me, actually. Um, the, the milieus are so clear in this story. You know, sometimes you have to really like dig in to figure out what the music's supposed to sound like. But I, these are my people. I, I grew up with this. So when you talk about, you know, something like that, what is, what is you know, a Catskills resort in the 50s, it's like uh, all of us of a certain age, uh, you know, we knew our grandfathers had a copy of Bagels and Bongos by Irving Fields. You know, we, we all used to listen to that. And the stuff in the 90s, I was actually alive then. And so, I mean, I, I sort of, I just, I, I, the pulse of this show was very clear to me. I had to make sure that it, um, 
that it was clear without sort of being, you know, a, a nail on the head. I still wanted it to have a sound that it was its own thing as opposed to just sounding like a sort of a cliche or, or you know, a, a pastiche of all that stuff. Uh, so I, I had to walk that line uh, pretty carefully. And uh, in this case, for the first time in my career, I got to work with another lyricist. All of those uh, jokes uh, were actually courtesy of Amanda Green, a uh, fantastic <laughs> lyricist. She also wrote the lines that weren't jokes. She wrote all of them. Um, but so, uh, so Amanda and I really had to like work together to find a way to, to give the show its own sound and its own energy while really honoring this stuff that I love so much. It's you know, I, at my heart, I'm somewhere between the Muppets and Stephen Eadie, and that was kind of what we did. Yeah. Um, so your star is um, a beloved comedian, but not a professional singer. How did that? like help shape the, inform the composing? I, you know, I'm also not a professional singer, so it was not, it wasn't that hard. You know, Billy, Billy Crystal sang those opening numbers at the Oscars and a hundred million people were watching. So I figured, he's okay to sing. He's gonna be all right. It's, um, the, the rigors of doing, you know, a full show and then doing it seven times a week and then being a certain age and you know sort of catching up to all that that was all stuff that uh, it's just technical lining up to that um, singing in character is uh, is tricky and that's the stuff that Billy and I got to work the most on is sort of how do you take your voice and bring it into this character so he's acting while he's singing so that's all there but Billy's you know I, the thing about Pros is they're just pros. I mean, he's you know he's the reason he loves this character so much is because it's this is a guy who knows the business and he knows how to do it and he knows how to go out there and kill him every night and that's what Billy does. So there isn't anything I could have thrown at him that he wouldn't have figured out some way to do. Uh, but also, you know, no, I wasn't expecting him to be Ezio Pinza. Right. There's like this whole all the the college kids in the front. Every like every reference I'm making, they're all just yeah. like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Bring back the guy from, from Girl from the North Country. We liked him. <laughs> um, so as you, as you suggested, this, this musical kind of reminds us of an earlier era of Jewish comedy and an earlier era of Borscht Belt resorts. Um, I wonder how you went about researching that world if you even needed to, and like what was going through your head as you sort of immersed yourself in that. I didn't need to. Uh, I, I really knew it. Uh, but I, I will tell you that Billy was also uh, constantly sending around clips that we'd just, you know, wake up, I'd, I'd get a text message from Billy Crystal, which is a cool enough thing, incidentally. Because <laughs> you know, he's in my phone as Billy Crystal, and so that was, you, know, the, you have a text from Billy. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he would be sending stuff all the time from the, the, the people who inspired him. He'd be sending Sid Caesar clips, or he'd be sending, like, some really obscure comedian that he found at midnight on YouTube, and he'd be like, oh, this is what you gotta see. And, uh, and so he was very clear on what, on what the energy he wanted the show to have was. He, he knew who, who he was writing to, but the, again, the rhythms of it, I, you know, I'm a, a middle-aged guy, Jewish guy in show business. I, you know, those rhythms I know, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's in there. Yeah. Uh, I wanna note that we're meeting during yet another tough week in America uh, after a tragic school shooting in Texas. I know you wrote a song about gun violence following earlier tragedies. I wonder what you think the role is for artists in helping the nation grapple with its many challenges. Really? Um, <laughs> what do I think the role of the artist is? I think artists have a lot of roles. I think uh, this stuff is really hard on me. Uh, it's been a rough week. Um, what I really think is that we all can do what we can do. Uh, I am not a legislator. Uh, I am not any kind of politician. I barely know how to speak to people. So I'm not any use at that. I can really do one thing. I do it well, but that's sort of what I'm limited. I can't keep a plant alive. So that's really sort of like, I'm, I, the thing I can do is I can open my heart and I can put it into a song. And if that song is a thing that inspires a person, if that song inspires an action. What I'll say to you is that last night, 
totally unexpectedly, Betty Buckley and I, we had always been planning to do a concert uh, for the Clinton Foundation, which we, we did last night over at Gotham Hall. And uh, the program we had planned out months ago, and the program was a song I had written called Hope, uh, another song called The Song About Your Gun, and, uh, and uh, No More, the Stephen Sondheim song from Into the Woods. We did not realize, because how could we, that we were going to be singing it in the context that we sang it last night. To be able to do Hope and a Song About Your Gun for President Clinton and for Secretary Clinton and for all of the other people in that room, people who really do the thing that I don't do, people who do make policy, people who are politicians, people who will go out there and try to change the way the country works and sees the issue, to be able to feel like I could make a connection to them was like, okay, that's the thing I can do. I could say those words, Betty could sing them, I could write them, I could play them in a way that nobody else was going to do it that night. Nobody else was going to get up there and speak that way from their heart about this thing. And so I felt like, all right, that's, it's not, I don't, it may not be much at all, but it's all I got. And I, it would be stupid of me to pretend that I've got some other gift than that. The artists, the artist speaks and, uh, you know, people either listen or they don't, but what other role could I possibly have? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us today and congratulations on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Good. So our final show today uh, is Paradise Square, another new musical. Um, it is set in a Manhattan bar in 1863, uh, where the friendship between black and Irish New Yorkers is threatened by Civil War riots. Please welcome the show's Tony-nominated star, Shakina Calocango, <laughs> performing a song this is Let It Burn. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I know why you have come here, and I know all your names. You really think your faces can hide behind those flames. I fed you at my table, let you all run up a bill. Is this the thanks you give me, how you repay goodwill? If you think I'll run away, you've got a lot to learn. These walls do not define me. I say, let it burn. Inside this little building is a rare and special lot. We somehow found each other, and look what that has brought. A place you are afraid of, a world you'll never know. You can take it in a flash, you can burn it down to ash, the none of ash will grow. If you think we'll run away, you've got a lot to learn. We're stronger than your first.
you have come here what you want to erase but I know that our spirit is bigger than this place look at what we have created we gave ourselves a voice we were safer separated but love left us no choice and now all alone i stand at the point of no return these walls do not define me. I say, let it burn. Let it burn. Let it burn. Let Please give it up for Daniel Edmonds on the piano. Wow. It's crazy to sing that out of context, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing. So we have a lot of New Yorkers here. Um, this show is set in a real neighborhood that no longer exists, called The Five Points. What did you learn about this city while, while getting ready for this role? Oh my God, I read like 11 different books because I didn't learn this in high school. And um, the knowledge of this black community, I mean the Five Points is known for its violence, its prostitution, but rarely do you hear about the fact that this was also a place of freedom, of refuge for people, um, of African Americans um, who newly escaped um, from slavery and found refuge in these places. Um, and this idea of these two marginalized groups, the Irish and both the black, that end up getting separated by the elite is a story we all know that keeps getting repeated in our history. We have so many commonalities and they always try to split us apart. And so it was really wonderful to be able to tell this story because it feels so relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention the draft riots. I mean, not to mention the riots on January 6th. That, and I found out in May that um, I was doing this. They offered me the parts. I was like, Let's go. This is amazing. <laughs> we get to use it. Yeah. So the number that you're just saying is the 11 o'clock number. It's the big number in the second act. I wonder how you protect your voice and your emotional energy through a show and what you do to sort of psych yourself up as you know this moment is coming. Well, this week I've not been so successful. There's a lot of <laughs> present stuff, you know, that we deal with. But I mean, I am steaming. I am downstairs. I am um, having lozenges in my mouth, drinking water, and just like praying, praying. I pray every time before I go on stage because I don't know what the voice is going to sound like on any given day, <laughs> especially on those two show days. But yeah, but it always happens. So that's good. <laughs> This show depicts uh, an idea of America that might have been with racial harmony at the bar that your character runs. What, what do you want people to take away from that story? If anything, it's to be fearless in the face of injustice. I think with everything that has happened um, these past years, there's so much that we live in, that we're bombarded with fear. This idea of fear, you need to be scared of the other, you need to be scared of each other. And I want us all to be aware that we are still human beings, we are all a community together, we have to take care of each other and love one another, excuse me, um, if we want this community to be better. And so I hope it makes people fearless when they come out, you know, to, to stand up for each other. Because we all, we're all we have, you know. One of the interesting elements of this production is that it also addresses a chapter of dance history uh, in which uh, dance forms with both Irish and African uh, histories kind of collide and mix. And 
Uh, many historians believe that that contributed to the origins of tap dance. I, I wonder if you can talk about the function of dance in this show. Oh, it's its own story. Um, I, I think that's the beauty. The, the dance is also a language of these two cultures. And, and you see uh, when they merge uh, of just the beauty of what could be, what, what we, we can create, honestly, together when you look at these two societies and the birthplace of TAP comes out of that creation. So I, I can only imagine what else we can do as Americans from different places, what can be created from that. Yeah. So this is your second year in a row as a Tony nominee. Congratulations. Um, last year's Tonys were a bit of a mirage, lots of streaming, lots of cancellations. This year is like slightly more normal. I wonder what it's like going through this experience this time when you're sort of allowed out into the world. This feels like the first time, because everything was virtual. Um, so I didn't get to experience anything, the luncheon, seeing each other, um, doing events like these. You know, it's, it's exciting. It's overwhelming sometimes. But I'm so grateful to, that we're back, that we get to love each other and, and see each other's work in this way. Um, it's exciting. This is my first time leading a musical, so the fear is in my spirit. <laughs> and I'm just like so um, grateful, honestly, grateful for this opportunity. Yeah. So you went to school here in New York? I did. Uh, we have a number of students uh, from Juilliard and Princeton. Yeah. And, uh, Come on! Uh, NYU, uh, <laughs> and the New York City Public Schools. Um, awesome. So what advice do you have for uh, kids interested in a life in theater? Oh, go train, go see everything, live a full life, study everybody, um, watch people in the street, on the trains. Um, and this is a, a, a long journey. It's going to be very rough. You need support. You need people who can look out for you. There are going to be tough times. Um, but if this is something that you know you can't, live without, go for it. If you can do anything else, do something else. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, that brings us to the end of our time together. Uh, I want to say thanks to all of the artists who shared their time and their talents with us. And thank you all for joining us, both in this room and online. It means so much after so long apart to be in a room full of theater lovers again. Um, if you want an easy way to follow our theater coverage, you can sign up for our weekly theater update newsletter at nytimes.com slash newsletters. And if you want to ask questions about our coverage or what's going on on Broadway, I think uh, the students are sticking around for a brief talk back uh, that will start in a minute or two. And you're all welcome to stay as well. Uh, whether you're staying or ducking out, uh, thanks again, and be well, and go see some theater.